House Democrats and Republicans form a truce over the budget. That's up next on Capitol View. Hi, and thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Capitol View, the show where we talk about Illinois politics and government. I'm your host, Jamie Dunn, with Illinois Issues Magazine. And with me today is Kevin McDermott, State House reporter for the St. Louis Post Dispatch. Kevin, thanks for coming. Chris Wetterick, State House reporter for the State Journal Register. Chris, thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. And Drew Thomason, State House reporter for Illinois State House News. Drew, thanks for coming. No problem. Uh, well, first off, today there were some interesting developments on the state budget. We saw uh, a strange alliance that we haven't really seen recently. Chris, can you fill us in on what happened? Yeah, it's like Batman and Robin or something in the <laughs> Illinois House. Uh, House Speaker Michael Madigan and, and uh, House Minority Leader Tom Cross, they kind of came together at some committee hearings yesterday, or I'm sorry, on Thursday and, or Wednesday. That was Wednesday, right? Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, you know, they basically said that they were going to hold the line on spending to what the House's revenue estimate uh, is, which is about a billion less than the Senate, and it's also less than the governor's uh, revenue estimate. And they basically said they're going to hold the line there, and, and they hope to, you know, um, have that amount go through the entire budget process. Um, so that was unusual given that the, the two of them have kind of been at each other's throats for the last three or four years. Um, I thought it was kind of reminiscent of kind of an alliance that Madigan struck with the two Republican leaders back in 2004 uh, when they kind of teamed up to fight Blagojevich, the former Governor Blagojevich, and uh, the then Senate President Emil Jones. And that fell apart, if you recall. I'm right. waiting to see how this one falls apart. I mean, these people, it's like, it's like, you know, the back rooms of a castle or something with the royals all fighting with each other and forming these little alliances that come and go. It, um, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see if if in fact they do, uh, they do stick with this. Yeah. yeah, it was a little surreal to see the two of them sitting at a table together, presenting to a committee when they maybe haven't even been on speaking terms, at least not in public, for the last couple of years probably. I mean, they've been civil, yeah. but they have both been saying we can't work with each other on the budget. So right. this was definitely a big development. And you know, they, they kind of brushed off all the questions about the, the former or the past bad blood between the two of them. and. Uh, you know, they kind of asked, you know, they kind of pretended, oh, what are you guys talking about? We don't even know. Um, I think they said it was a fabrication of the media. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, this is a situation where Cross had billboards all over Chicagoland basically blaming the state's fiscal problems on the Speaker. And, of course, the Speaker, you know, is known for his tactics on the floor of the House to bottle up uh, Republican bills. And, you know, he had a, a phrase that he kept using last legislative session. He called them uh, non-participating dropouts. <laughs> All that was gone uh, on Wednesday, though, when, when they got together. So Well, and uh, Madigan kind of spelled out a scenario in which the House could take control of the budgeting process. Drew, I know you covered this a little bit. Can you explain how this would work? You know, uh, well, basically, uh, when the, the two chambers can agree on the specifics of a bill, they come to a, a conference committee where you have five members from uh, the House, five members from the Senate. They try to hash out the details. and. Uh, they, they then report that back to, to the two chambers. And Madigan basically said that, um, that the House members would vote in favor of the House's version of the bill. And he expected, since the House has more conservative revenue projections and spending, that uh, the Republicans in the Senate would side with them and thereby kind of steamrolling over the, the Senate Democrats. Um, talked to Senate Matt Murphy, who's kind of the budgeteer for the uh, Senate Republicans, he said, on principle, they like more conservative numbers, but they weren't just going to side with the House's numbers because they were smaller. So it, I think that uh, that'll definitely be interesting. This is something they used um, uh, back in the 90s and maybe a little bit before the conference committee, but there, there was um, other pieces of legislation and, and amendments and just a bunch of uh, things getting introduced during that. So they kind of pulled back on that here for the past decade, two decades. Yeah, I think they said, was it 91 maybe? Yeah, they started merging the budget bill into one big bill and it was just kind of an up or down situation and it hasn't gone through this conference committee typically in the last about 10 years or so. Another thing the speaker said that was interesting was that, that the members themselves are going to drive the budget process through the, the various appropriations committees. And of course that's a huge departure from what we normally have. Uh, the last two sessions, the 
legislature has given the governor a lump sum budget, which basically he could spend and allocate amongst the different agencies as he saw fit. And, but before that, it was we had a system where the four leaders got together with the governor, and sometimes it was only the, the two Democratic leaders, um, and they basically hashed out the fine points of the budget, and that was it. And the budget was delivered to the members, you know, hours before it was voted upon, um, you know, on the final day of session. It'll be interesting to see if this actually, this process that they've kind of outlined holds up. I've kind of been cynical about it, but, you know, you see increasing movement on the budget you know, in the month of March, which we don't see normally. Well, I think it's going to be really hard for these rank and file uh, legislators who haven't had to deal with this, who you're going to, and we've seen it in appropriations committees. A lot of people come, are coming for them, and a lot of them have really good cases for why they need their money um, and why maybe they need more money, but it just seems like that money's not there right now. So you're going to be looking at legislators having to disappoint some some constituents and some other uh, vested interests in the well, state house, and I think that that's exactly the reason they <clears throat> used to do it the way that they did it. What Chris was talking about with this, these sort of four tops would get together and, and they would just uh, hash it out themselves and, and lay it in front of the members in the final hours of session and make them uh, make them vote up or down. Uh, I all those years, these lawmakers all said, "Oh, we don't like." like it this way, we want to be part of the process. I never believed that, and I'm, <laughs> I'm very curious as to how they're going to react now that they really, if they really are part of the process, because it does, it'll put them, th there's no good decisions to be made here. I mean, there's not enough money, you can't raise enough money uh, with taxes, you certainly can't cut enough. Um, everybody says we don't want to borrow, they're, they're borrowing on the backs of state vendors right now. Uh, no, nobody really talks about that. but. I mean, there's, why would you want to be part of a process where really the only solution is, is to decide who's going to be hurt and, and by how much? Well, and without that uh, ability to pull rank with that leadership, will mm -hmm. we even have any context of a larger picture, or will everyone just be trying to defend the things well, that they need to defend to make their people well, that, happy in their that's area? That's another issue. I mean, I, it, it, not only politically do you want to be on the hot seat, could this really, can this really even work? I mean... Today we listened to the House argue for about an hour, maybe it just seemed like an hour, about milk crates. <laughs> and these people are going to deal with the budget, really? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be watching. Well, and, and Speaker Madigan did say he would have suggestions for how these appropriation committees should funnel their money, decide where to spend. So uh, I think that's a, another interesting uh, aspect to, to how it's going to play out. Well, another piece of this, with it being a, a member-driven budget, is what Madigan was calling it, uh, it seems like Quinn is being tossed out of the process to some degree. Uh, they said, we'll take his considerations and, you know, he can come to us and, and we'll weigh what he wants. But, you know, Chris, I thought that was pretty interesting that it, yeah. they outright rejected a lot of Quinn's budget yesterday, or at least Madigan did. They did, and there's kind of been signs of that for months. I mean, there was, or for the last, at least since he's given his budget address, that they didn't take what he was proposing too seriously. Uh, Madigan expressed doubts on the day of the budget address and Senate President Cullerton basically canceled a news conference because he didn't think the numbers added up, mm -hmm. uh, you know, himself. Uh, it is interesting, I mean, we, we, you know, I tried to reach out to the governor's office yesterday and, and you kind of got what you typically get with them, kind of a non-answer. I mean, there was no statement of, you know, of strength that he was going to be, you know, he was going to get his way or that he, you know, would, would try to persuade them, just that you know, that he would continue being in the process and kind of see how it goes. So I'm not quite sure how they're going to deal with it. I'm not sure if they know either. Well, and for that matter, if the House is looking at maybe uniting the parties to have a little bit of a power grab where they would control the budget more than the Senate, uh, Cullerton didn't have a lot to say about that yesterday either. That seemed to be yeah, an aspect sure of it that uh, maybe took them by surprise a little bit. So Yeah. Which I mean, nobody else really has an answer to this. I think it would, I don't know that it was a surprise, but it, it certainly, you know, was, was out of the ordinary. Which, it's possible Madigan was speaking off the cuff about the procedure in general, but uh, the House seems to be making a lot more numbers uh, progress on the budget, whereas mm -hmm. the Senate is still traipsing people in front of appropriations committees and listening to testimony. Uh, the House is saying, here's the numbers. Yeah, Go the House has out. put numbers into writing. Uh, they did, that's what, that's what Madigan, I mean, they, these were routine bills that the two of them were presenting, but yeah, they had actual numbers attached with, you know, for example, the teacher's retirement system payments. I mean, those were numbers that were kind of, a foregone conclusion anyway, but um, yeah, they certainly are, are the, the pieces are starting to come together in the House, whereas in the Senate, there's not, there's not similar action, I suppose. When you say those things are foregone conclusions, but uh, part of the 
point of their committee hearings, I think it was to say, we're going to pay the pension payment, we're going to pay the employee health insurance payment, all the things that are required of us, our debt service, um, before we start doling out money to programs. That hasn't always been done. We haven't always made the pension payments. I mean, no, how does this no. compare, Kevin, to, to say under Bogoyevich? You know, I, I've been covering this process for 16 years now, and I, I have to tell you, no two years have been completely alike. <laughs> I mean, under Bogoyevich, you basically you basically had uh, trench warfare. I mean, that's what the whole budget process was about. The last couple of years with Quinn, uh, what you've had, you know, as, as, uh, as Chris or Drew mentioned, was uh, um, the legislature essentially dumping this in the governor's lap. The temptation had to have been there to do to do that this time. If, in fact, they're serious about letting rank-and-file lawmakers really drive this process and be involved in it, um, that's something that for years, in all the years I've been here, everybody's been saying that that's something that should happen, that, that, that you know, that's what they're here for. But, again, there's always been this suspicion that maybe they didn't really want that and, and that perhaps it might not even work. So I, I'm not sure what to make of it. I mean, it... Um, Again, the temptation must have been there to do what they did last year and just say, let, let's, you know, let, let the governor deal with this mess. We don't want to deal with it. I, I, I suspect that they're probably worried that the public's on to them, that they're going to catch all kinds of flack from the editorial pages like they did last time, that they're, that they're going to be viewed as, once again, not doing their jobs, and it may just be as simple as that. Being an ex-editorial writer, that was an easy thing to decry at the end of no. session was, you know, oh, how dare they approve this at 1 o'clock in the morning with... With no, with no one's read the bill. I mean, I think they're mm -hmm. kind of trying to head that off this time. I don't know why they suddenly care about it, but um, you know, maybe with the tax increase and all of the other uh, kind of liberal social legislation that they passed at the end of, of last session, maybe this is like an attempt to show that they are transparent and you know that the public can have a little bit of trust in them uh, in, in showing how the sausage is made as, as it goes on. The other thing that uh, kind of stuck out to me with, with the House is there's really no plan to pay down the backlog of bills quickly. They're no. saying, you know, if more money comes in than what we estimate will come in, that will automatically go to pay down the bills, but that wouldn't be determined until well into the fiscal year, I would think. Right. And there's just no upfront, here's how we're going to address this, at least at this point. That's a huge problem in, in Madigan and Cross. I mean, it, their proposal is to do just what you said, uh, but it's not clear that that, that money will come in. Um, and even if it, is, if it does come in, you know, they're going to have what, let's, let's say the Senate projection is right and they do have a billion in extra revenue. The state has, I think, well over five billion in bills to pay. Um, you know, what are you going to do, wait five years to pay those bills off? Yeah, that seems to me to be a hole in, in the logic of, of their approach. They kept saying, well, people will see cuts, but they'll have more certainty. They'll know if we tell you this is what you're getting, this is what you're getting, even though it's less. But I don't see that as being entirely true if they can't figure out a way to address that backlog. Right, the old bills will just stay out there. I guess. I mean, that's yeah, and that that backlog is should should be scandalous. I mean, that is that really is the state borrowing from vendors uh, without paying interest. Every time you hear one of these lawmakers say we don't want to borrow, that we're going to be responsible and not borrow, it, it's an irresponsible thing to do. I, I can't uh, I can't believe there hasn't been a, a revolt among these vendors yet. I mean, some of them are going months without money that's owed to them, and they need it. It's a lie to say they're not borrowing. I yeah, mean, really, it is. Yeah. I think it's a case maybe where people have, have heard it over and over again. It's this whopping number. It kind of got to the point where the deficit got where people sort of become desensitized mm -hmm. to it after a while, too. So, um, One of the other big uh, political developments that's going on or that's kicked off recently is redistricting. This is a pretty insider baseball thing, but it's something that's really closely watched in the legislature. It's basically drawing up the map for the districts that uh, legislators will run from and happens every 10 years after the census. Uh, they had the first hearing in Chicago this week and Drew, you attended that hearing. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, um, the, the main point of that hearing, the, 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 the group that really made its voice heard there was, was the Asian American community. Um, Asian Americans in Illinois are the fastest growing uh, minority group and in, uh, in years past they really felt that they've been up underrepresented. Uh, Chinatown, for example, I, th I think has, in Chicago, has three different senators and maybe five different uh, state house representative districts running through it. It's, it's really been chopped up. And uh, what they're saying, what the, the representatives were saying uh, of the Asian American community was that they want, they want to be represented as a whole so they have influence. There are no um, elected Asian American officials in the state, whether uh, statewide office or in the state legislature. 
And, and they're not even saying they, they want to elect an Asian. They want to be able to elect someone that they want. They want to have influence. Um, that really came across pretty strong. But there, there's also uh, a, a bunch of other, uh, especially minority groups, who are saying, we want the same thing. The problem is uh, Chicago lost 200,000 people in the census. So logic would follow that they're going to lose some kind of representation. So everyone who wants all this uh, representation, which equals power, it, I don't really see that being able to, to happen. But I'm sure that happens every year. Everyone wants as much power as they can grab. But the, there's only there's a finite amount of that. And, and then this, this was the first of five, uh, at least five, that the, the Senate's going to hold their Senate Redistricting Committee. And the House put out their schedule today as well. Yeah, they have they're going to have 15 yeah. around the state. Okay. And uh, Senator Kwame Raoul, who's in charge of the Redistricting Committee in the Senate, said that um, they will look to maybe hold other hearings. But a lot of the issue with the hearings is uh, there's no map yet, and people are concerned that once there is a map, it will just be passed through the legislature pretty quickly because it's a very political issue. Uh, incumbents want to protect their seats and protect their districts. So uh, any word on whether we're going to see a map at any point? I think there's been some movement about uh, letting people use some of their own software to at least play around with the map. Well, and the, 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 there has been talk of that, and the, uh, there's actually a public station now in a building next to the Capitol that's open pretty much business hours Monday through Friday for like 9 to 5, I think, um, that would allow the public to come in and create their own map. It has all the census data that you need. It has the program you need. You could sit down there and draw out a map, which is, I sat through, uh, a couple of us sat through a, a press conference demonstrating that, and it's a very arduous and tedious task. So I don't know <laughs> how, how many people are actually going to do that. But um, yeah, th th that's a possibility. And whether we'll actually see a map before it gets voted on, that's a real question. Because for the first time since the 1970 Constitution in Illinois, you have one party, the Democrats, controlling the House, the Senate, and the governor's office. Um, so really, they, they could pass this thing so quickly that, that no one really gets a chance to look at the map. By the time you look at the map and realize that, hey, my district's changed, I've got a whole d different senator, a different representative, um, it could be, be the new law of the land. The draw your own map reminded me of what Governor Quinn did a year or two ago when he had that website and he invited people to solve the budget problem <laughs> himself <laughs> yeah. by, by suggesting cuts, and the, and the cuts were invariably uh, some tiny fraction of what was needed. It really kind of maybe is only useful for driving home how difficult this stuff can really be, even if you take the politics out of it, which, of course, you can't. You know, I, I think it's, we all make the assumption that Governor Quinn will just sign whatever Madigan and Cullerton cough up. I think that there's a real potential for him to, to you know, have some shenanigans going on with this map. I mean, you, you'd asked earlier, well, how does Quinn insert himself into this budget process? His signature is needed for that map, mm -hmm. and he can, he can hold it up if he wants to to get something out of Madigan. It really gives him a little bit of leverage, um, and I don't know when, when or on what issue he would choose to use it, but you know, I think that's, that's out there as a possibility because the last thing the Democrats want to risk is having, um, having to go to the coin flip and the Republicans winning the, you know, winning the coin toss for whatever reason. Could, so. could he use his amendatory veto to change the map? Good question. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Can you <laughs> I, I don't know the answer. That. <laughs> Maybe next that, week. That could be uh, an interesting <laughs> aspect to that too. If if the governor could kind of present his own map, almost. Where's yeah. Charlie Wheeler? When I know. Yeah. We need, we need Charlie Wheeler. Well, and he's uh, shown in the past that he'll at least uh, move in that direction. He did it with the Capitol bill. It didn't really pan out because the House right. decided, hey, we'll just hold on to it, and then you won't be able to use it as leverage. But he did say, you know, I'm gonna not signing the Capitol bill until, uh, was it the tax increase? I can't remember what he was yeah, holding he, out for. He held it hostage for, for the tax increase, I think, for a while. And then, it just, then he just signed it, I think, in the end. And I think that sort of raises another question. Is anything big going to get done before this map is done? Because it, it, it plays so much leverage. It's for a legislator trying to keep their job, it's overarching more important than anything else that's going on right now because yeah. it's, it'll apply to the next 10 years. Well, it is, but the, the answer to that question is probably not, although I don't, I don't know what, what big important stuff really has to be done other than the budget, which, again, they're making noises about actually tackling that this year. Um, what we're seeing, you know, this 
session is what we see a lot of sessions. Something like 6,000 bills have been filed, and most of them do nothing or next to nothing. They do very minor things, and they're squabbling about smoking and guns and some other stuff. But uh, for the most part, no, that you're right. This is going to shadow everything. Everybody is um, kind of looking at this map as, as uh, the diagram of their future. I mean, and, and you know, we've seen before where legislators, individual legislators, obviously get cut out, or they get put in situations where they're suddenly having to represent areas that that they're not familiar with and where people don't know them. And, uh, you know, the shenanigans are legendary. I mean, we, we know what the current map looks like, and we know about that one district. I can't read is it the 17th or the, the 20th? The one that looks like, a, yeah. like two or three snakes embroiled in some kind of fight. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> running around the whole. You, you know, that, that, that's what I'm looking forward to, is seeing what kind of shapes emerge from this, what kind of Rorschach test uh, yeah. this map turns out to be. Well, I think you make a good point, though, with legislation um, coming back every year. This is one of the only things that doesn't feel like Groundhog's Day in the yeah. General Assembly because it only happens every 10 years. It so. only happens, and, and it's for real, uh, unlike so much of what happens there. I, I think that nothing gets done before the map, nothing gets done after the map. I think <laughs> they just, in the last, at the end of the last session, in the veto session, in the lame duck session, they forced so much major legislation That's through right. the system, I don't think it can take anything else, really. I mean, I'd be surprised if if, for example, the, the concealed carry, I mean, I think we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But a, I sort of disagree with you on that. Yeah. I actually think that's one that maybe this year, I, I, Charlie and I have argued about that. I think it's, I think it's for real this year, but I'll... Oh, yeah. No, no, speaking of Groundhog's Day, <laughs> let's move on to some of these issues that uh, come back every year. Chris, you're touching on concealed carry. This comes yeah. back every year. That's always highly debated. People have very emotional reactions to it on both sides. Do you think this year... I, I just say that because of the Senate, uh, you know, the Senate is the more liberal chamber and it has a liberal Democrat as, as president and, and he doesn't seem real, uh, you know, enthusiastic about it. We heard, we heard rumblings of a deal between him and, and the uh, NRA types that uh, he might get or he might go along with it if he got increased penalties, and I'm not, I'm not sure where any of that lies at this point. I think Kevin probably has a better idea. Well, there, I there's, I mean, what, a couple of things that are happening. We've talked before about these Supreme Court cases that are sort of giving them fuel. There's also the, the lobbyists uh, for this are sort of taking a, a new and really surprising strategy that uh, they're, they're trying to pull um, the Black Caucus from Chicago into the fold. And they're actually, now I, I've, I've not heard that they've turned a lot of votes there yet, but I've talked to a couple members of the caucus who, who didn't say, oh, that's ridiculous, we're, gonna, we're not going to do that. I mean, there, there's actually some, some talk that even as a cultural matter, this whole notion of this thing as a, as a crime preventer is, wh whether you believe that or not, is, is taking hold in some areas of Chicago to the point that even some of the lawmakers who previously would have been solid votes against this uh, are now starting to reconsider that. I think that might be crucial. Is there sort of an appeal of in some high crime neighborhoods mm -hmm. that the people that have the guns are criminals, so maybe you law-abiding citizen would like to have a gun that, to that protect is, yourself? That is exactly their argument, and, and again, whether you, whether you believe that that's, you know, that that's an effective form of protection or not, and there's a lot of argument about that, it's certainly an effective form of politics. And there was some polling, I think, that was going on this week that some, some uh, maybe indicated polling. this. Yeah, there, or was a, there were a couple polls out that, that essentially, um, uh, you know, purported to show that, that Illinoisans were uh, pretty heavily in favor of this. Uh, if you look at the individual questions of the polls, it, it really did, some would say, fit the classic definition of push polling. Um, do you want to feel safe in your neighborhood? I mean, that kind of question. <laughs> well, do you want to feel safe in your neighborhood? Well, you're going to answer do, no. Yes. To that. That's, how they, that's how they lead up. But, but you know, ultimately, this won't be decided by polls. It'll be decided by votes on the floor. And I, I in every every year, this does come up, and every year it does um, it does fail. But I, I I have had a sense just from talking with the people, not just the people in favor of, but the anti-gun people as well, that this this might be the year for it. Well, another issue that has come up uh, fairly often and not had a lot of movement is allowing smoking in casinos. And I know you've covered this some um, uh, since yeah. you cover kind of the <laughs> Illinois-Missouri issues. Yeah, um, we just can't, you know, we, two years ago we banned smoking statewide, including in casinos, and now they're trying to undo the casino part. Uh, and this actually did pass the House narrowly by two votes. Um, I, I would be stunned if this one survives. I don't think it's going anywhere in the Senate. Yeah, and we t we've touched on this a little bit. Senate President John Cullerton is not a fan of smoking. No. Um, he would push for a dollar a pack cigarette tax. Recently, he uh, sponsored one of the versions of the smoking ban. Right, exactly. So it seems odd. Why would so many House members want to put their votes on a controversial bill like that, knowing that it's not going Yeah, anywhere? you know, it, because the, the controversy is going both ways. I mean, a lot of people in the border regions, including the Metro East, where, where you know, where I cover, 
uh, really are convinced that this thing is hurting the casinos. And, and there's some evidence of that. Now, now the people who are in favor of the smoking ban say that the casinos are just the victims of, of typical you know, economic problems right now and that it's not about the smoking ban. But either way, um, that's, that's sort of what they can hide behind. I mean, you, to be able to tell your people back home, look, I don't like smoking either, but this could be a matter of jobs. At least that's the claim. You know, the anti-smoking folks make an interesting counter-argument to that. They point to these brand new casinos that have been built in Iowa and across, even across the river in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. the, the, is it the Lumiere, is that right? right. These kind of grand Vegas-style casinos. And then you look at uh, our Illinois boats where the owners haven't necessarily made a lot of investments in them. Um, you know, and they're saying, they're making the argument, well, people want to go to the nicer casino, basically. And I haven't heard a real effective counter-argument to that from the, from the boat owners other than the numbers about how much money they've lost. Um, and the proponents, of course, note that, uh, or the proponents of the smoking ban note that, uh, you know, none of these guys have gone out of business or have even put their casino up for sale because things are so bad. I mean, there's, this is an industry that is still making a lot of money. And there's still uh, folks that are seeking casinos and wanting more licenses, and there's right. definitely, at right. least someone sees a potential for growth in the market. So. Absolutely. Um, well, we've talked a lot about the House, but the Senate uh, did do some things this week. Uh, we got about a minute left. I'd like to talk a little bit about this plan to merge the Comptroller and Treasurer's Office. Uh, the constitutional amendment passed today. Chris, can you uh, kind of go over yeah, what that would do? Basically, uh, you, would, you would get rid of, of those constitutional offices, and you would have one constitutional office called the Comptroller of the Treasury. Combining the two offices is estimated to save about $12 million. Um, it passed unanimously in the Senate. There wasn't a single dissenting vote. Um, you know, the prospects in the House, the, the Treasurer, uh, Dan Rutherford, told us today, um, you know, that he's talked to the Speaker and the Speaker has expressed some concerns, which you're not sure how serious that is for this measure's, you know, prospects, but, you know, it's always something, you know, to keep a look at. I mean, the fact that it went out unanimously in the Senate doesn't necessarily always mean that it'll have, you know, you know it'll be free sailing in the House. Well, and this is kind of another case of Groundhog's Day. This idea has been around for a while, so we'll see where it goes from here. And we'll have to end on that note. Um, I would like to thank my guests for being with me today. Thank you, Kevin, Chris, and Drew for joining us. Um, I'm your host, Jamie Dunn with Illinois Issues Magazine. And we're kind of getting on the downslope here. A lot of interesting things will be happening. So please tune in in the coming weeks for updates.